Hi everyone, um, my name is Andy Turner and I'm one of the people running this webinar today along with Lydia who's just stepped out of her office for the moment. Okay, so um, Lydia and I are going to do this webinar together in some sense. I don't think we've quite practiced our tag team approach, um, so we'll see how it goes. So the, the idea is to give you an idea what the technical assessor is is looking for and also what the technical application what the the goal of the technic, technical technical application actually is the aim is to assess the overall technical requirements of the project and here we know that it might not be it's not just the technical requirements it is also does the applicant know have the appropriate knowledge to use the system effectively. So has the applicant experience of running on large, no, on HPC systems, full stop. Are any of the direct systems appropriate for the project? As you probably have seen, or when you look at for the technical application, that you will be told where to find the information on the hardware. Please go have a look and see if what you plan to do can be done on those systems. Are the requested resources reasonable? Um, I had there was an application a while back where an applicant asked for a complete system which had 24 gigabytes of RAM per core and an enormous amount of core hours, but actually the applicant really did not know what they were asking for. Can happen, that is what we're here for. We will help you in order to make a reasonable assessment what you need. And is the direct, then you have the choice of four systems and out of the four systems, you have three different architectures. Is that what you have chosen? Is that appropriate? And does the applicant then after that realize how the system is technically configured. For instance, all of our systems are running parallel file systems. Does the applicant actually know what that means? It is also the aim that we help the applicant in the process. The process can be interactive and the assessor might actually contact the applicant for clarification. So it's not really a the assessor might advise the applicant to apply for a seed corn to get some more information on the code, such as scaling. Um, and the seed corn form can be found. And it's very straightforward. And apply for it, and you could get up to 50,000 CPU hours just to get the information that is required for the ap technical application. This is specifically true if you have never used an HPC system before. And that is the next thing as well, very new HPC users actually to under, help to understand how their code might run on the system. You might have a perfectly clear cut idea what you want. You might have configured and programmed your system for MPI, but do you actually understand how your code runs on 100 cores or 100, no, 100 individual compute nodes? And also, we are here to facilitate for you for the applicants to gain access if the science application is suitable and their research would greatly benefit from the use of the of a system in order for us to help the applicant has to help with the process to make the best possible recommendation yes at the end so if you look at the technical application form, we will give a score. Uh, at the end of the technical application form is the, is the scoring and the questions that the scorer is asked to give scores on. So do the applicants have the technical expertise required for the proposed work? <clears throat> you might not have it when you apply, but you might have a considerably better idea by the time the application process is complete. Is the software that is specified technically suitable for DRAC? 
you might have 300,000 individual processes to run that don't need any communication and they don't need a lot of I.O., then the Dirac system is not for you. On the other hand, if you have 300,000 jobs and each one of them requires a large amount of I.O., you actually might be right on the system because the system also has very fast I.O. and that is what you might require. In order for us to identify if, your, if the amount of course you require is justified, there's an, uh, we asked you to give evidence of how your code scales. And there are two different types of scaling, so please look at that one and give as much information as you can, not as you might have at the moment, but as you can, because the better that is described, the higher that part of the mark will be. Does the applicant understand the data flow of the application? I mentioned already that each of the systems has a parallel file system, and a parallel file system is not very forgiving if you hammer it with a lot of very small IOs. However, it can be used very beneficially if you are doing your application to make best possible use of it. Then you could ask for a lot of compute time, but is that compute time the amount that you request reasonable? And you have to give evidence for that. Are the storage requests reasonable? I mean, we have um, in total, I think, about 12 petabyte of data storage available to the to the, the the community. So you could, in principle, ask for two petabytes. However. The chance is you don't need it, and the, another chance is you can't get it because there's already quite a bit reserved. So have a look what you require. Have a look if that what you require matches the applications and put as much evidence as you can get. So overall, we are looking at the suitability for the Dirac service, and we are looking for the requirements, if have the requirements for the technical capabilities of DRAC. So in the end, we, we would ask, would a different computing resource be, be more appropriate? And the overall score will be out of a total of 10. Any question of that, on that? So should we then go through the technical form um, see what is required. And what Olivia is doing, I guess what we can say is, you know, if um, some questions occur to you after um, this webinar, or you know, you don't have to ask what you want to ask during the webinar, then please just contact the Dirac Help Desk, um, and we can pass your question on to the most appropriate person to answer it. Um, don't be shy of asking, essentially. So this is the technical application form and that application form has a sample application included. I would strongly urge the applicant to go and look at the resources that are available and above all look at the instructions in the application uh, in the document that you also find when you uh, download the application form. So first of all, give your details. Now, I find John Doe a little bit funny, so I use different uh, different names here. Give your, and I have been a bit sexist, so I assumed automatically it was a man. Uh, but please don't take that the wrong way. It is, um, yeah, an applicant can be a postdoc, can be a PhD student, can be an academic member of staff. You have to give your address. Ideally, you give your affiliation, what type of topic it is. You need to give your telephone number just in case. Definitely an email address, preferably your academic email address. And please give a title. And then in the next line, you are asked to identify what type of project it is. A short project goes for a few months for up to a year. A thematic project is beyond the year. 
and up to three years. Please provide a start date and I should mention that um, the technical application form as of a week ago would have been missing those two, uh, sec th those two um, um, boxes. Can you please go and download the current application form? And also you need to put the duration of your project and that is a month. Please don't use weeks. Um, it will be rounded down or rounded up to months. In the next section, please, you, you are asked to give the code or codes that you will be running. If you are running, if you are, if there are two codes, for instance, that will be run for the majority of time, then please give both codes or if it's more. If you have only one code that is predominantly run and a little bit of tidying up afterwards, then please give your main code. The next bit is, the software that you require the system to uh, to provide. In this case, we're giving the Intel compilers and it's quite detailed. You might not necessarily need the latest, greatest version of something, but you might need a minimum version. So please put your minimum version in. If you require a GNU compiler, because it only really compiles with the GNU compiler, say that, but you might want to consider to make your code more portable and also get it compiling under an Intel compiler, for example. So all the relevant softwares that you require for your code to, to link against, please put this one into these. Comments. The next bit is, we would like to know if you have local expertise. If you say no, then we would like you we would like to know how you would want to run this one, how you would want to judge it. So please, that doesn't mean um, you cannot say no. It's purely we would then probably ask you also to apply for research software engineering support unless you have strong support somewhere else. <clears throat> Here it says that the RSE, um, that are you applying for research software engineering a report? Uh, Lydia, yes. We've got, yes. Question, we've got a question from Martin. Yeah. Martin, do you want to ask your question? Can you hear me? Yes, yes I can hear you. Um, I was wondering when you um, say here expertise in your group, um, does this only mean expertise on Dirac? or also on similar high performance computing centers as well? No, anybody with whom you work. Your group doesn't mean that is that it has to be Dirac. Your group means the people you work with. Where you yes, have, yeah. where you no, can I'm not asking what out. your group means, I'm asking what the expertise means. Are you after expertise specifically on Dirac or no, would you no, also no. count expertise um, on other price machines in Europe? No, if you have, for instance, worked on SuperMOOC in, in Munich, yeah. uh, then you have expertise on running on an HPC system. It does okay. not mean to run that you have to have run before on Dirac. Okay, thanks. Okay, in this case, um, Going further in this, uh, um, here I, uh, I mean, I filled this one in. I hope it is more or less consistent. I said no. Initially, at that moment in time, when I fill it in, I might not think I require any RZ support. Do you have any other support? Like yes, in this case, it says support from the code developers, which. In, uh, Swift is, uh, has a very tight um, group of code developers and there you could be a member sort of hanging on to that group or being loosely involved with that group, but you could get support from them. So if there's a, a no say to expertise in your group, then please tell us how you think you can cope in the box, summarize any other requirements. 
In this case here, the, there was considerable support for SWIFT. I mean, this is reality. However, there could be a chance, it could be that we would consider an application for one month RSE time. Although at the moment we say no, but maybe the assessment of this technical application might help us to make up our mind. The next bit is most important. As I said, all of these systems are HPC systems. They have high performance interconnects. They have parallel file systems and they have quite a few cores. The smallest single, so the smallest core availability per complete system is Cosmos 6 and that has more than 9,000 cores. So it is important for us to identify if you understand your code and know how it performs. And there are two different um, ways of looking at this and there's weak scaling. I always find these a little bit um, um, confusing. Weak scaling means you take your code, you have um, the application is for one set and then you scale your application. You make it, you make the number of particles or the problem bigger and bigger and bigger to give the same amount to do to any process when you scale it out to more processors. That is weak scaling. Now, in this case, for this application, it is important to look at weak scaling because the idea is that we would try to maximize the number, the amount of memory that is used, and we would like to run a very large job with a lots of memory. So we need lots of cores for that. How does that fare? Do we know how it fares? Does it make sense to do so? Will the code actually work at all. So the information is given in this form. So please understand the application for, for number of cores one is as big per core as the application is for eight as it is for 64. So we increase the number of particles to make the load per process very similar indeed. And we look at up to 4,096 cores. And the time to solution is actually very similar. So it scales very well indeed. I mean, it doesn't scale perfect, but it scales very well indeed. It's 25% slower to run uh, the equivalent relative size on 4,096 cores than on one. The other thing which you would like to know is if you if you can provide that one in a sensible way is how does your code actually perform and there's a how how much does it spend in in the parallel library how much does it spend in itself how much does it run how much how much time does it spend in the individual libraries that you might be linking against and you can do that one incredibly easily by using a tool called OProfile and you can run it straight out, to, out of the box without any specific um, uh, parameters, uh, just with the PID of the, of the job and you would get something like this. I'll give you three samples of this. The first one, I would always stress that you run it for a while, so say 10 minutes, then you stop it, and then you look at the outcome. In this case, it had 3, 376,000 samples, and it shows that it spends about 56% in the code itself, 32% in MPI, then 6% in lib pthread, because Swift is using pthreads, then 3% or 4% in system calls, and then the rest in HDF5, FFTW, and things like this. So that is a spot, that is a spot check. I did another one, a little, uh, about one and a half hours later. The sample is not as big, so maybe it is not representative. I would stress that. But here, 
I found that now the time it spends in MPI is actually almost 43%. And that is possible because I might have hit a spot where there is more communication going because, of course, when you run 40 days or so, you don't always hit the same type of load. That type of information is useful. And it's also useful for the next section, namely the strong scaling, because assume for a moment you asked, you asked for 1,024 cores, but you need only about the memory for one system. And if you spend all your time then in communicating, which O-Profile could show, then you might be better off to run just on one system. You might get faster to solution. Good. So here I am with the strong scaling. The strong scaling is you take the same problem, same data set, same input, same everything, and you are running it um, on more cores. And I think that the O profile could give you quite a lot of information and how you what your code does if you go for more and more cores. So while in this application we are not really looking for strong scaling, it is a good idea to put it in. Because if you have reasonable strong scaling, you could get a faster real time to solution. So it could be that at one stage or another you think, okay, if I do it on um, 2048 cores or 2000 cores, it will take me 40 days. If I do it on um, 4,000 cores and I scale reasonably well, I could actually get there in, say, 30 or even 20 days. So it might make sense to consider if, although you do, don't initially intend to do this, if you might not need it, and for that, strong scaling is vital. So a strong scaling information would be great. But be realistic, in this case, the strong scaling goes to up to 224 threads. And you see, and here we are now limited by the number of particles. So that would be about a particle per core. And of course, then you can't imagine that you would get extreme scale, extremely good scaling. However, if you had another code doing the same, by this time, it might actually have turned around and you would have much slower uh, much slower time to solution. All that information is very valuable for us to assess, A, what your code does, but it's not just for us, it's actually for you to think about it. The next bit alludes to um, how much data you produce. I said it already at least three times. Each of the systems has a parallel file system. And the parallel file system prefers large streams of output or input. They don't really, really like small files. And if you have lots and lots of small files, A, it's in inhibiting you during the run of your code, and B, it is inhibiting your ability to browse your files. If you have 100,000 files in a directory, it will take quite a while to do even an LS on it. If you have uh, what ha happened once, if a user creates 200 million files, it can take four days to remove them. Um, so it is highly important that you identify what your job is doing with respect to output. In the present case, we have three types of files. A log files, which are readable text files, and they are limited, and there's an, there is the odd output from one process. There is only one process that writes to these log files. Then you have the research data output, which in this case are called snapshots. They are in parallel HDF5. Uh, they are written in parallel HDF5, and there, there's one file written per snapshot. And that file could be, in this case, one to two terabytes, or if it's a much larger application, could be 20 to 30 terabytes. That would be benefit that the benefit of this one would be 
to parallel to um, use parallel, uh, not parallel, to use striping in Lustre. The restart files, every single MPI job will write a restart file. This is essentially dumping the memory at the time of the writing. And that is the equivalent to the amount of total memory the job requires. They are best written, not in striping, they are best written a restart file at the time, all concurrently, and you can get, in this case, that has been verified, so you would like to do that one, you would like to consider that one when you prepare your directories where you write to. The other thing is, this case, um, there's also a question, assume you said that your output had 100,000 files, then the next question would be, uh, would be essential and the answer would be highly desirable. Would you consider an operational plan to reduce the number of files? So here I would suggest if you indeed have a large amount of files to consider this one, you might even want to consider to look at your code and reduce the number of files. The next bit is how much data is read in each job. In this case, when the job starts, it will run the read the initial conditions, which will be a few terabytes. It will also read a parameter file, which is a text file, and that's a few kilobytes. However, if the run is interrupted, it will read the restart files, and that is much bigger. That is the amount of RAM that is required, so it could be up to 50 terabytes for the for the, the, the example I describe here. And of course, you have to have these data stored somewhere. And then it's how much data do you create for each job? In our case, the restart files are the single, uh, in, during the run are the biggest, uh, are on the biggest demand because we would like to keep two copies of the restart files, uh, simply because the the last copy could be could be corrupt, and then you would like to go back to the to the one before, and that would be a total of 120 terabytes, roughly. If you then also consider the snapshots, and we are looking at about 120, 130 snapshots, and each snapshot is between one and two terabytes you are looking at about 200 terabytes of actual data and all of this one has to be stored up to the end of the run. Next one is the size of writes and reads. If you are looking at uh, reading small chunks continuously from 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 um, individual processes, you can bring your Luster file system into difficulties and you will not proceed. So you have to consider what the size of the writes, and the same is for the writes, what the size of the writes and the reads are, and you have to consider a plan to optimize that. In our case, the restart file, the restart files, each MPRM will write it. And yeah, this is found by experience. DRAC is not a long-term store. You can store your data during your project, but then we DRAC requires the space back for new and other projects. So you need to have a way and a plan to handle your data. In this case, in the examples case, the restart files are only of value during the run until it has reached redshift zero, and then they can be really, then they can be deleted because that's it. The snapshot files, on the other hand, need are required to extract more information, and part of that is part of the project, and then they will be stored somewhere else because there will be lots of post processing done on those files. So the snapshot files will reside on the system for the duration of the project, but 
we intend to make a copy. We will make a copy of those somewhere else for for and we would investigate to have a full tape copy. In this case, we don't say where that would be, but we need to have a plan for that. So the next bit is where do we want to run it? And here you have a choice. There are four systems: it's data intensive in Cambridge, data intensive in Leicester, extreme scaling in Embra, and memory intensive in Durham. And here there's one column missing, which since I have introduced, and that is the actual available time on the 1st of April 2020. That is not here. For instance, on extreme scaling, we will have, as the situation is, no time available on the 1st of April 2020. So it is of little benefit if you apply for it, and if you apply for it, we will have to consider to move your project to another of the system. Can be done. Tesseract is different from the others because it has a hypercube. It has less memory per core than the other nodes. So it is a possibility. So we can move a job from uh, allocate or planned for on, onto another system. Please, if you have already downloaded this form prior to Friday of last week, please uh, download it again. It has slightly changed. But in here, you will tell us which system should be chosen. And in this case, um, I have chosen 9 million core hours on the memory intensive system in Durham. And Durham has two different systems. It is the memory intensive, which has 16 gigabytes per core. And it has Cosmos 6, which has 8 megabytes per core. Here is a comment which I would like uh, to read to you. For all of the section below, what is the next one? The exploitation of the CPU resources per node. It is important to find, um, to give information of what you intend to do. We are, in this case, we are looking to evaluate that the applicant knows how to use resources efficiently through an understanding of what limits, of what limits the code performance. We do not expect codes to necessarily use all cores or all memory or all interconnect performance or all I.O. performance, but the applicant should be able to explain why technically they run a configuration they propose. For example, if you underpopulate the number of cores, so assume a node has 32 cores and you only want to use four, we would like to know why you would like to use only four cores. If you have a low memory requirement, but maybe then you don't need the high memory system, which is the MI16, or because that the MI, MI system in Durham. If you would like to have the, if you believe that you need the hypercube or the network configuration as on the, um, on the, um, on Tesseract, then please let us know what you would like to do on this one so that we can help and advise. Might not, the Tesseract system might not be the available one. So that is the type of information we would like to know. It's not that you have to use all the memory, but please tell us why you don't use all the memory, why you want to have that number of course, why you don't want to use all the cores on, an, on a node. The other thing is, if the memory usage is not uniform, and that is in the memory per node, which can happen in a large-scale structure calculation, we would look here for the information on memory high watermark, the average memory usage. To obtain those, the applicant might want to run a representative application where and check on the memory usage using top might not be at this moment in time possible. So you um, give us an argument why you think what it could be. So the next bit is we would like to know what type of jobs you have. In this case, I have been in 
incredibly ambitious. I would like to run a job on 140 nodes. Each node has 28 cores because that is what the memory intensive system look, looks like. I do not require any GPUs or KNLs. And I, I have put the total wall clock time per job. Please realize that a job, uh, for instance, on the memory intensive system, the default queuing time, the default time is 72 hours. So I could also have put here 54 days divided by 72 hours number of jobs. It's irrespective if you can tell us how much work clock time for each job day is. We will not assume that this is equal to the amount of queue time. It will require 60 terabytes of RAM and it will use, um, yeah. And then there's the largest job, there's a typical job and there's the smallest job. I believe, I think that is maybe not representative for some of the, for some of what you want to write. But just assume the largest job you want to run, then some average job and then the smallest job. It's tricky at times to find the right words. I, mean, I think one thing I would say is that the table is not meant to be prescriptive, I don't think. If, that is precisely adding, it, yes. If, if adding an extra column or just having one column or two columns suits your profile better, then modify the table to fit your needs. Yeah, that this is an edit, edible, um, uh, you can edit this document. It is not, it's not, you You don't just fill in your numbers, you can edit this document, as long as you don't take any sections out, like uh, exploitation of the in fast interconnect. You really don't want to give any information. So now assume you have two or three codes that would run this project. We would look at three tables of two or three tables of this type, one per code so that we can make up um, uh, our, that we can check that A, you can calculate or use a pocket calculator, or uh, that you also have an idea how the workload between the individual parts of the application would be run. Um, so yes, if you only have one major code and the other code is a little bit subsidiary, that is not required. If you have a thematic project and you have a few sub projects on the thematic project, we will definitely require for each of the sub projects um, the, the job mix and the information. And we will also require for each of the major codes scaling plots and for each of the major codes what the IO profile would be. So your document will increase in volume and you should make quite clear which code it is you're describing at the moment. So this table would duplicate or triplicate or quadruple, uh, or have quadruplets. The next bit is how you would like to have your resources allocated. By default, we will allocate per quarter the amount of allocation divided by the number of quarters there are for your for your application. In this case, there would be three quarters. So we would expect by default, if you don't put anything there, that you get three million core hours per quarter. If you want a different type of profile, you have to tell us. And here I put, I couldn't decide, am I happy to have equal quarterly allocations? I'm not precisely sure. My preference would be to have it like this. So here we would ideally have a yes or no, because I couldn't make my, my mind up. I said yes and no, but my preference would be this. The next bit is we would like to know what, how they expect their workflow to be. So please describe it. You can put it in a table, you can put it in words. In this case, I have uh, put it in words and I said our code is very well tested and we can immediately go into production. 
if your code isn't tested and you would like to have a bit of run in time, you might want to choose in the first quarter, you might want to choose a moderate amount of core hours so that when you are ready to do full production, you have more, more time remaining. In this case, I said we can immediately go into production and the first, the largest application would be done first and we would like to do that one in the first quarter. For post-processing and comparison, we will run three medium runs concurrently and then three small ones. So then I describe how the job is being run uh, within the batch queue environment. It can be restarted using the restart files and it will be composed of successive runs. The succession can be adapted to the site's batch, batch policy. So if it's 72 hours, as in our case, uh, as in the Durham case, then it would be stopped every 72 hours. Or, however, it would be advantageous if the large job could run for a longer, more extended period of time. So could we please ask, and it is possible to ask this one here, might never happen, but it is good to identify um, plans and maybe needs at this stage. Could we please have 10 days work log time at a time because then we don't have to restart so often and it would be much more advantageous for the overall setup. We would get quicker work log time to, to solution. And here, actually, because of this, I say that maybe we have calculated with the idea that maybe we don't have to restart so often, but if we have to restart so often, and if we can't read the restart files in an optimal way, then maybe our, the uh, amount of CPU time might not be sufficient because we have to read all that data and that costs time and that actually clocks up uh, as soon as, uh, starts to clock up as soon as the job starts irrespective of what the job does at the beginning or at the end. So it is good to notice it. It's good to write it down, if not necessarily uh, for the assessor for yourself, because it shows that you have thought about it. Here, for the thematic projects, we would need to get more information. Usually, thematic projects have sub projects and it um, and they can they are more flexible maybe in using the resources more uniformly because if one project hasn't one sub sub project is not yet ready to start another one might be and you could start so the information and what you require how your profile would be and which system you would require or do you require for a little while one system completely all of them should be put in here good and then you have to look at how much data space you require home space is limited it's usually backed up so you're not putting your major data in your home space you put your code into your home space simply because it's backed up. You want to have a uh, fast reacting IO space for your work and you might want to store your applications completely in that work workspace while you are running it. But the actual data that you produce, which has to be saved, that is 200 terabytes and you might want to consider and might want to ask for archive space if that is available within the Dirac. But if you put it in here, then that gives us the opportunity to plan, or we can simply say, sorry, we don't have that, but you can look for it somewhere else. And that is essentially the form. Yeah, Ingo asked the question, is this example case available to download? Yes, I can make that available. Yes, yeah, so we'll be making all the slides and the um, sample application form available to download along with the recording of the webinar. Uh, yeah, I had uh, the same question. And um, also, I wanted to say thank you. That was um, very informative. 
Thank you. If nobody have, if other people don't have any questions right now, I have a few slides on the RSE group and RSE support, which I just wanted to show people to give you an idea of what's available there um, in terms of your application. The Dirac Research Software Engineering team so is a team of technical expertise in helping people um, develop their codes uh, distributed across the different Dirac sites. So there's a resource at the University of Edinburgh, both from the School of Physics Astronomy, which is led by Peter Boyle, um, from EPCC, led by myself, um, from the University of Leicester, which is currently led by John Wakelam, uh, from the University of Cambridge, led by, Jeff uh, led by Jeffrey Stammond. And uh, the management of the team is actually provided by Peter, uh, Lydia, and myself at the moment. And at the moment, we have about three FTE technical effort per annum, but that we're hopeful that that's going to increase um, as time goes on. Um, I'll describe a bit more about what the ARC team can help you with in a moment. But there are two different ways to apply or to access Dirac RSE support. One of them is when you're applying to the RAC, such as the currently open core, you can apply for, when you apply for a project through the RAC. Um, and you can also apply for ad hoc support via the Dirac help desk. And I'll say a bit more about those um, just now. So through the RAC, you can get um, effort from the Dirac RSE team. The idea of these sorts of projects are for larger scale pieces of work. So things like um, allowing you to change the software to allow you to do uh, simulations that you weren't able to do before, either because the code didn't scale or it didn't have the um, uh, functionality in it required. So they're the next two points. Um, to all of the projects through this through the RAC call should lead to measurable outcomes, um, which could lead to wider accessibility in the user community. So say you have an in-house code and um, you've been successfully using your research group, you think it might be more useful, it might be useful more widely to the scientific community and you need some help to uh, turn it from research code into something you can release um, to the wider community and get help with, then uh, you can apply for RSC support for that sort of activity as well. Um, other outcomes, generally, which are of specific importance to the Dirac community, um, say it would help in joining up communities and bringing the code development together and bringing different development groups together and things like that. And also, looking at preparing uh, codes for future uh, tier one systems such as Dirac. So that's potentially different processor technologies, um, improving the maintainability and sustainability of the code so that it can be more reactive and more usable um, going forward. Uh, to new resources. These sorts of projects through the RAC are expected to be for around three to 12 months of effort. Larger requests can be considered and have been awarded in the past, but they have to be um, fully justified as to why you need that longer period of amount of effort rather than um, the standard amount of effort. Okay. Um, in terms of actually applying for this effort, through this RSE effort through the RAC, um, we, what we really need as part of the application process, and there's a section for RSE um, application on the general application form, not the technical form that um, Lydia just showed, was we require enough technical details to assess if the project's feasible in the requested time and some sort of technical justification for the work. So not just, um, I think my code could do, my code struggles to scale and um, I need some help to make it scale better, uh, which may be true, but actually the evidence for um, potentially where the scaling issue is coming from in terms of a profile and what sort of time scale you think uh, or what sort of level of work would be required um, to increase the scaling. So an outline work plan for the project with the time scales for proposed work, profiling or technical evidence that supports the proposed work. So like I say, either a profile or um, some analysis of the code of where you want to introduce new functionality and show how that's going to fit into the wider code structure that gives the uh, team the ability to assess this and understand if it's feasible or not. Each project, should, each proposal, yes, okay. So if you don't put it there, then we can't see it and that hinders the assessment of it. I mean, it means it's less likely to, less likely to succeed in the application. Right is what Lydia is saying there, I think. So each project has to have a list of objectives for the proposed RSE work, including an associated set of success metrics. 
And these metrics have to be specific and measurable because we use them to assess whether the objective has been met or not at the end of the project. So that maybe sounds like quite complicated and quite an overhead. That's not actually what we're aiming for here. And if you have a question, you know, if you want advice on how to write these sorts of things and what sort of information you need to provide, then please contact the Dirac help desk ahead of submission and we can discuss it and help you um, understand what information you need to provide and make sure that you've got the right sort of information and the right level of detail in your application. Okay. The other method um, of asking for RSE support is ad hoc small amounts of effort. Um, so through the help desk you can just ask for some help um, for relatively simple sort of standard tasks. For example, like porting your application to a Dirac resource, say it's not you tried it yourself or with your uh, research group or with your support team and you've not quite got it working but you think you need some more technical help, then just um, ask on the help desk. Uh, we can help you to run profiling, i.e. to support a future RAC TA as Lydia's just described, or RSC support application. So if you're not confident in using profiling software and understanding how it works, then we can help you do that um, and also hopefully provide you with um, a bit of expertise so that you can do it yourself again in the future um, so that your group um, can learn from that um, process. And finally, we can give you some help in benchmarking applications on DOAC resources and understanding the benchmarking and why you see the performance you do. Um, I give you advice on what's the best sort of benchmarking you want to do to support for example, a future application, or just to make sure you're using the resources efficiently, efficiently and getting the most out of the time you've been awarded. The way you get this sort of support is just email the direct help desk. The only thing I would note is that um, the RC time available is finite, um, so we can't guarantee to support all of these requests, uh, but we'll do our best to support whatever uh, comes in as long as it's reasonable. Um, that's all I have actually on um, the RSE uh, first part. I don't have as detailed an uh, overview as Lydia did the TA form, um, but if anybody's got any questions, I'll be happy to uh, try and answer them at least, or I'm happy for you to contact me or the help desk directly afterwards um, in the future if you've got any questions. Andy, I would like to make, I, I put a little comment out in the chat. Yeah. Um, I would like to uh, impress again on the people and this is because I found an example of a previous uh, RSE application. The RSE application is pretty sparse. Uh, however, the applicant had put a load of information and what he required from the RSE somewhere in the science case. Now, I should mention that we don't be the TAs and the RSEs might not see the full science case because, let's face it, there's an awful lot to read and there's a finite amount of time. We will see it, but we might not go with a fine tooth comb through the whole science case. So anything you have to say, either in the technical application or in the RSE application, put it there. Don't put it somewhere else. You really have to put it somewhere else if you've got no choice for some reason. At least signpost it and tell us the subject we need to go and read. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for everybody uh, coming along. Um, thank you in particular to Lydia, who's put a lot of effort into um, getting this up and running. Um, and hopefully we look forward to seeing your applications in the uh, next RAC call.